For those of you that don't know me, my name is John. I'm a third year medical student and a professional MCAT tutor. What you're about to watch today is a small excerpt from one of the lectures in our brand new high yield MCAT e-course. It's around 50 chapters of the most high yield topics on the MCAT. Link is in the description so that you can learn that a little bit more. So let's get it. Light. What is light? Light is actually um, multifaceted and the, the leading theory that explains life, light is one called wave particle duality. Um, light shows that it has wave-like and particle-like properties. Well, what is a wave? Okay, I want you to think of like an ocean wave, right? And we'll discuss this later, but like an ocean wave or classically you see the sine wave. Um, you probably saw this in some of your physics studies. Particle, meaning uh, any, any type of particle that you can think of. Now classically, particles have mass, uh, photons do not, but it exhibits um, some condensed concrete abilities. And this is shown by things like the photoelectric effect. So I'm gonna briefly, briefly explain the wave-like nature of light, the particle-like nature of light, I'll mention the experiments that prove it to be true. Even though they're not high yield, I love physics, so we'll mention it. And then after that, I'll show you um, how the MCAT commonly tests light in general before we even go to optics. So this is awesome, buckle up, um, let's jump into it. So we discussed that light is both a wave and a particle, but what does it mean to be a wave? Well, that's what this slide is about, the wave nature of light. A wave in general is a dynamic disturbance that propagates. And you're probably like, what the F did you just say? Like that's way too confusing, you're all over the place. So let's take each of these individually. Dynamic, meaning it moves, it's constantly moving. Disturbance, meaning it changes, and delta is how I say changes, it changes the medium that it's in. I want you to think about, I want you to think about a wave in water. Well, the medium is water, and then a wave is steadily altering uh, the, the water. It's, it's actually moving the, the physical components of the water. A sound wave or pressure wave, they are, they are actually moving molecules to create that pressure wave. So dynamic meaning that it's constantly propagating. Disturbance meaning that it's impacting the motion. And propagating means that it travels through a medium. Now this is important because whenever you see a wave, let's just, I'm just gonna draw a basic sine wave. Whenever you see a wave, I do not want you to think that this is just like, especially when we discuss the particle nature of light, I do not want you to think that this is just one particle that's moving the whole time and it's just like going up to like <laughs> y equals one and going down to y equals negative one. That's not really how a wave works. A wave is, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to think of it as bumping into particles adjacent to it. And that's a classical wave. And there are two types of waves, which we will not discuss in this guide, because again, this is a high yield guide. But just be able to recognize that a wave is something that moves, it's dynamic. It creates a disturbance, meaning it's impacting the medium that it's within and it's propagating, meaning it's traveling through that medium. It's not, it's not actually only traveling and it's surrounded by a medium, it's actually propagating through that medium. So that is what a wave in general is. Now, light behaves as an electromagnetic wave. I don't think it's really worth trying to go too deep into what that means. I think you should probably just, you're not gonna get asked a question on what an electromagnetic wave is. So maybe that's just something you commit to memory. And the reason that waves, or the, the wave portion of wave particle duality is necessary is because physicists um, had a lot keener uh, intuition than, than I did, and they observed things like interference, diffraction, and polarization. Um, and none of those can be explained by a particle. And we'll talk about the double slit experiment in just a second, and that will really hit it home as to why it can't be explained by a particle. But this right here just shows the necessity of light being viewed as a wave. All I really wanted you to take from this is what a wave is and that light behaves as a wave. Now, light can also behave as a particle because it's different, it's built different. Um, it behaves as if it, as if it consists of photons. Now, and a photon is a quantum of energy, um, and it depends on the light's frequency according to this equation. But before we get to the equation, which we will, because that's how this gets tested on the MCAT, I wanna talk a little bit about photons. So photons have energy, 
Photons also have momentum. Photons do not have mass. That should really, really confuse you. And that's okay, and that is explained in quantum physics. We will not cover that, but you should know um, mainly that light has energy, light does not have mass. And this is all part of its particle nature. Now, that energy is described in the equation E is equal to HF, where H is Planck's constant, and this is a number that you should unfortunately commit to memory, 6.6 um, .6 times 10 to the negative 34, my bad, that's not minus 34, that's raised to the power of the negative 34, joules, unit of energy, right, times hertz. And again, this right here should be raised um, to the negative one, my apologies, times hertz, which is our unit of frequency. So that makes sense, right? Um, we multiply that times frequency, which is this F, and it's gonna cancel, cancel out this hertz, and we're just gonna be left with our unit joules, right? So E is equal to HF. Commit that equation to memory. I believe it's in the math guide, but if it's not, it's right here, and it's a beautiful equation. So wave-particle duality shows or describes how light is actually um, composed of both wave-like and particle-like properties, and we kind of discussed those earlier. Um, I wanted you to take from this slide on waves uh, what a wave is and what creates a wave and how light fulfills those, those uh, criteria. And then the same for particle. I want you to understand why light is viewed as a particle as well and um, how photons interact in that because photons are something you're going to see on test day. You're going to see a discussion of photons on test day in some form or fashion. We also discussed Planck's constant in this equation. So that's what I really want you to have memorized from those three slides. Now, we can actually get very, very creative um, with these equations, and I realized that I skipped one, so let me go back, I got too excited, I jumped the gun. When we're discussing the wave-like nature of a particle, we should use this equation, which is C, um, or you can be substituted for V, because C just stands for the velocity of the speed of light, which in a vacuum, which is standardized in a vacuum, and it's standardized as three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, which is fast. So whenever you hear a light year, that is, you multiply this times how many seconds are in a year and you get a light year. So that can kind of give you some, um, maybe that can give you some reference as to like just how far away things are that are like a light year away. It's really, really impressive. So velocity is equal to lambda, which is the wavelength. That's that weird upside down Y um, wavelength. I'm sorry that my handwriting is so beautiful. That's actually the only reason they let me into medical school. They like they're like, I don't care about your scores, just let me see you write. And they were like, oh, that looks like a doctor's handwriting, you're in. Uh, wavelength times the frequency. Remember, wavelength meaning um, the length it takes for a wave to complete one entire oscillation. And frequency meaning how many times per second we actually get that oscillation. So an oscillation, you would just take the peak to the peak, and that distance, um, it's usually measured in nanometers that distance is going to be your wavelength. Frequency is just going to be how many times per second we get one of these oscillations. So it can be from peak to peak, it can be from cross, cross to cross of the axes, whatever, they should be the same, I just didn't draw them to scale because I'm not an artist. The wavelength of a light is important in several different contexts, and we'll, we're gonna throw it all the way back to where I learned this in first grade, which is also where I met my wife. Um, Roy G. Bibb, the colors of the rainbow. So I think this is important to commit to memory because this is in descending order of your length of your waves. So 700 nanometers approximately is red and then violet, I can't really remember. I think it's like 300-ish, 350. We'll say 350-ish. This is something you should look up. These are the wavelength differences. And this is important for you to know because if the MCAT ever tells you that you have a red wave versus a violet wave or a green wave, then you should be able to calculate the energy difference between those two waves. Um, and I'll show you how in that combination of equations that I was talking about earlier. Whenever the MCAT is gonna test this, they generally require you to use this substitution method. And you see this equation here, and it looks like a new equation, but really it's just a combination of the two equations we saw above, which is C is equal to lambda times frequency. You may see, instead of frequency, you may see nu, uh, the Greek symbol nu, but we'll, we'll just put F for frequency. I mean, it's a combination of that with 
H or E is equal to HF. So if we were to take this equation and solve for frequency, uh, we would say C divided by lambda is equal to F. And now, using substitution, we can take all this because it equals F, right? And we can plug it in right here. And that's how we end up with this beautiful equation, energy is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by lambda. This equation is only applicable to uh, light in a vacuum, that is. But if, if we were given, say, uh, the, the velocity of another wavelength, um, another light wavelength in a different medium besides a vacuum, then we could just substitute C for velocity and get the exact same thing. So this equation is one, or this substitution is one I really want you to be familiar with. You're gonna get a lot of questions correct on the MCAT by knowing this right here. And I'll actually show you the experiment that I've seen. See, I took the MCAT four times. I believe this was on two or three of them, and I've heard from like probably 50 plus students that this was on theirs. So I'm not telling you the exact question, but I'll set up the experiment. Um, what ends up happening is they describe an incident light ray, which is an incident light ray is just the one that's um, leading into uh, the one before you hit like your new medium or your lens classically is what it is. And so they have a light with a uh, energy of one, and then they describe an experiment where this bar or this like photoreactor or whatever dumb fancy word they want to use absorbs this photon and it emits a second photon with a different energy. And they're going to want you to calculate the um, wavelength change of that energy. And they may even just ask you to guess it without giving you true numbers. And the Either you're either going to straight up plug and chug, meaning you're just going to use the numbers that they give you with these equations to calculate E2 or to calculate the new wavelength or something like that, some, some variable within this equation, or they may just ask you to kind of guesstimate it and know that if a photon were to hit a photo detector, then remember our discussion of the conservation of energy, some of that energy would actually get dissipated as like um, heat or something like that. So we're going to say that E2 is equal to E1 minus the energy of the heat. Now this right here is not an equation that you have to use. This is just for me to explain this to you. But what you would need to know is that E2 would end up being less than E1 because it lost some energy due to heat. E2 is less than E1 because it lost some energy due to heat. And then you would have to pick like its wavelength or something, um, E2's wavelength. And of course, according to this equation, we see that wavelength is inversely related to energy. So if we wanted the, wave, the energy that was lower for our correct answer choice, then we picked the wavelength that was higher. So that's a very classic experiment, and that is just one of the more difficult ways that this equation is utilized, although there are several easier ways you'll, impact, you'll see it impacted on your MCAT and test it on your MCAT. I just, I had a really big pet peeve in the eighth grade when I was taking like uh, algebra two or something like that where the teacher would give us really easy examples in class and then our homework or our uh, tests would have really difficult examples. That bothered me, so I like to show you the hardest way that it's tested on the MCAT and then trust that you can work backwards from there to the, the more straightforward ways where they just give you the numbers and you have to like intuit them from the passage what they actually are and solve for it. Very important to us for our residency applications as well as for the pre-med community that we can grow this channel. And we really hope that you will support our journey into matching to the specialty of our choice. And it's an honor that you're watching this video and allowing us to be a part of your path to your MD. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe to the channel and share it with a friend. Check out the link to the description if you enjoyed the content today for the access to the full high yield course. And we will see you in the next one.